So big hello to everyone um, and thank you for joining us this evening to listen to a fascinating talk I think in our series on Let's Talk Climate Change. My name is Harini Nagendra, I'm from Azim Premji University and I lead the Center for Climate Change and Sustainability at the University uh, where we focus on issues relevant to climate change, the environment, uh, human relationships with the environment and a large canvas of things that that covers. As uh, one of the focus areas mm -hmm. of the university and indeed the foundation, so the university is part of Azim Premji Foundation, which has a deep interest in sustainability for a very long time. And as one of the things that um, which form our mission uh, is to do climate communication and communication on the environment to outside audiences and to public audiences. And so we have had a long and successful partnership with Bangalore International Centre. This is one of the things that we do at uh, BIC every year. Uh, so at least once a month, uh, once in two months, we have a Let's Talk Climate Change series and we've had a number of wonderful people come and talk at this. Please check out the YouTube channel of the university and of BIC where you'll see the older talks. For instance, Professor Mahesh Rangarajan from Ashoka University started us off with a talk on the Anthropocene. We've had a number of wonderful speakers. Ruth De Vries from Columbia University has spoken about millets and their importance to India's sustainability transitions. Jaya Sundi has spoken about uh, renewable energy in India. So you can look at these old talks on uh, YouTube. It's a great pleasure for me specifically to introduce an old friend, colleague, and someone whose work I admire very highly, Rohanatha. Rohanatha is from Nature Conservation Foundation, uh, Mysore, and in fact is one of the founders they set up this organization about 25 years ago and he's been working in the islands of Lakshwadeep as a marine ecologist for the past 25 years. So, but before I invite Rohan, I just wanted to also invite all of you to uh, our annual climate festival held at Azim Premji University. Uh, again, as part of our efforts towards public communication, we have this very large program called Forests of Life. Last year's theme was Rivers of Life. So we run this for 13 to 14 days. It's from on from November 2nd all the way to November 14th at the Azim Premji University campus in Sarjapur. We have about 15,000 plus students and visitors of all kinds coming to the university from different states, largely from the Bangalore region. It's trilingual in Kannada, English and Hindi. We've had, uh, we feature work of 130 plus young interns that we funded who have gone across the length and breadth of India to document its forests. We have music and dance and indigenous communities sharing their crafts and traditions and there are workshops and art. It's free, open to the public. We only encourage you to register in advance to manage crowds. So please go to the university website and you'll see Forests of Life. You can free register, come with friends, family, spread the word. We'd be very happy to have you. Yes, and with that, uh, I think I, Rohan is someone we've been trying to get for a while and uh, it's, um, he spends a lot of time in the islands so it's, it's good to have him here finally to, for the talk and uh, because all of us know about the uh, issues of I think of environment and coral reefs and why coral reefs are such a fragile embodiment of uh, climate change and as Rohan has been working on these uh, coral reefs of Lakshadweep and indeed on coral reefs across the world in a number of different contexts, we thought it would be wonderful for him to come and talk about his work and what, what does this tell us about climate change and human attempts to deal with climate change and indeed to, to survive alongside the environment. So Rohan, it's a great pleasure to have you here and over to you. So thanks a lot, Harani. Thanks for that introduction. <clears throat> So first up, I would like to thank uh, Azim Premji University and Dr. Harani Nagendran for inviting me to give this talk and to Bangalore International Center for, for hosting it. And I would like to thank you all as well for coming. If some of you have heard small sections of this talk before, you know, I hope that you'll bear with me. I guess I'm hoping that uh, with sufficient repetition, I may get some clarity myself about what I'm trying to say. Also, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge a subset of people who have accompanied me on these, some of these journeys that I will be talking about, not least the people of Lakshadweep, uh, without whom none of this thinking would have been possible. So as Harani said, uh, I uh, work with the Nature Conservation Foundation, and that's a badly sketched logo of the Nature Conservation Foundation, where I work. I'm sure most of you recognize uh, it as the Pashupati seal uh, from Mohenjo-daro. It has a proto-shiva sitting amidst a whole bunch of animals, both wild as well as domestic, as well as uh, representations of humans. And for us in NCF, it represents the kind of joint flourishing we would like to see between humans and nature. So, but 
25, 26 years ago now when we were actually choosing the seal, this was, I mean, there was a contender for the seal which, uh, which I really pushed for and it was this. It was, uh, you know, it, it was a dung beetle pushing a ball shaped like the earth up a conservation slope much like Sisyphus, knowing exactly how futile his endeavor was. And for me, this captured the perfect balance between humility and hubris, right, uh, that has characterized the conservation movement over the last several decades. Uh, at NCF, I have seen up close what it is like to do conservation research and action in the real world, and the increasingly urgent need to do it. You know, but speaking about conservation at the scale of an entire continent, or certainly at the world, is much too big a task for me. So instead, what I'll do is speak very, very briefly from my own experience of the conservation crisis over the last quarter of a century, from a perch that is only a few meters above uh, sea level, from where I've seen this crisis unfolding. And some of you have seen this as well, uh, and been to these places along with me as well. Since 1996, I have worked in these tiny coral, the, the tiny coral archipelago of Lakshadweep. Okay. The archipelago itself is part of a submarine ridge that uh, stretches from Chagos uh, south to Maldives and then uh, or finally to the Lakshadweep. This, uh, this chain of coral atolls was born, uh, I'm sure some of you know, in uh, the Reunion hotspot. And it was born in the Reunion hotspot and as the Indian subcontinent moved to hit the Asian plate, it dragged this entire coral uh, atoll chain along with it and that's how you get the Lakshadweep being born. The Lakshadweep is the oldest among this entire chain of, uh, uh, of atolls, where, with Chagos being the youngest. Uh, <clears throat> so that's what the Lakshadweep looks like when you come in, when you fly over it. Okay? It's a chain of 12 atolls that enclose these shallow lagoons and you'll see it's surrounded by this this uh, garland of white, and those are essentially the, the, uh, the coral reefs itself, which protect the islands inside. So you have a shallow lagoon, which is extremely uh, uh, very calm and very protected, and then you have the open ocean on the outside. The islands have just about, there are about 32 islands in the archipelago, but only 10 of them are inhabited. The rest of them are really small, or they don't have fresh water, and as a result, for one reason or another, they, uh, you, they're not inhabited. Now, they look like idyllic coral paradises, the kind that you'd expect in a postcard, uh, but the actual truth is that they are very densely populated. Okay, they have 32 square kilometers, but they have 70,000 people living on them, making them among the densest parts of rural India, and many of these locations are, are rapidly urbanizing. Okay. Fishing is the mainstay of the economy. Most of the economy is based largely on fishing. That is changing, but, that, but fishing continues to be an important part of the economy. And at least in the 1990s and 2000s, the fishing was largely for pelagic tuna, which means fi fish from the outside. They were not fishing on the reef as much, but fishing for pelagic tuna. And fishing on the reef was actually fairly light. Okay? So the outer reefs have dense and diverse coral reefs. These are really among the most beautiful coral reefs that I've ever seen. Uh, and from the very first time that I dived here, I was absolutely fascinated. So I first came here in 1996, and the reefs that I saw were among the most beautiful and stunning reefs that I've ever seen anywhere. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, over the last three decades, these reefs have been subject to significant declines as a result of repeated uh, El Nino events. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard about what El Nino events do to coral reefs. And that, this is a picture of exactly that same reef that I showed you earlier. Uh, but significantly bleached, the phenomenon called bleaching, okay? And this has been happening uh, over uh, the last 20 or 30 years uh, through subsequent El Nino events. And as a result, the Lakshadweep has become, in many ways, a poster child of the climate crisis in India. It is one of the places that is most vulnerable uh, to the impacts of climate change. And I have worked all my life on these islands, and from this very low perch, I have grappled with the crisis of conservation that these islands face. And frankly, and this is what I was, you know, want to talk to you about today, it worries me that nothing I have done in these last 25 years uh, rises to the scale of the problem of climate change. And it, one, it, it worries me that nothing that I've done over these 25 years can actually help address the problems that we are seeing in these islands. It has made me wonder about 
conservation as a discipline itself. Uh, so I, I should say before I start that these are a bunch of hastily penciled thoughts, and this is really about the start of a conversation that I want to have, rather than fully formed ideas. So don't take anything that I'm saying with, you know, with anything more than uh, half-formed uh, thoughts. So uh, this is the alternate title for my talk. Okay, the image I have in my head is that of a train hurtling out of control. You know, the crazy motormen of uh, neoliberal capitalism are just in the engine room, you know, shoveling increasing amount quantities of coal, you know, as the train is accelerating to some kind of inescapable doom. And from our, you know, there's no, we're running out of track and the train is accelerating. And from our various compartments, we conservationists, you know, are all shouting above the noise of the engine to try to stop the train in its tracks or at least reduce its speed, okay? I see myself sitting in the very last wagon of the, of the train, what they call the caboose, I think, in the US, and what we, what we call the brake van. And I'm shocked and aghast at what I see, but I have very little agency to do much about it. And when we speak of nature today, we often talk about it in these terms, as a rapidly accelerating crisis of immense proportions that is likely to be infinitely catastrophic. All of us, when we think about nature and the nature crisis, that's the way we think about it. And this goes back really to conservation as a discipline. Uh, you know, since its inception, conservation has been a discipline of crisis. Okay? So writing about a decade before NCF was set up, Michael Sule, who was really the founder of conservation as a, as a, subject, of, uh, as a subject of study, he laid out a, a powerful manifesto uh, for conservation. He insisted that it was an unapologetically mission-driven discipline, one that was interested not so much in the accrual of knowledge as in the delivery of results, right? So uh, he said that it is to ecology what war is to political science, right? Well, what surgery is to physiology. Of course, you need to understand physiology, but on the, on the, on the operating table, your physiology is not going to help you need to work with what's, what's, what's there in front of you. The biodiversity crisis, Sule says, does not give us the luxury of time to unpick all the causal links between anthropogenic impact and biodiversity loss. So we have to work with what we have. Aldo Leopold, that other great thinker of, uh, of, ecological, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of ecology, he said that the first rule of intelligent tinkering is to keep all the pieces. So you can tinker all you want, but just keep all the pieces. So this then is the primary mandate of conservation. Make sure you keep all the cogs and wheels. You can figure out about what, where they fit and what function they have later on. First, let's staunch the self-evident loss before we can figure out exactly what's causing the gaping wound in the first place. So Against that, of course, against uh, Sule's calls to arms, we should probably keep Daniel Webster's wise warning in mind as well, that a strong conviction that something uh, must be done is the parent to many bad measures. But having said that, I mean, the, 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 the crisis is self-evident, right? It is all around us. Everywhere we go, we see habitats ravaged by development. We see expansions of townships, encroachments by local communities. We hear of species declining as they are hunted or fished to extinction or as ecosystems shrink. Uh, at NCF, we've predominantly been concerned with the biodiversity crisis, and we've tried to address it in our different geographies, either by working with local communities uh, to spare wildlife, to reducing, re reducing conflict in, in shared spaces, or with various attempts at restoring wild nature. But if the biodiversity crisis was, was bad, the climate crisis is, if anything, even worse, okay? At least with the biodiversity crisis, our enemies were clear. Okay? We knew who the enemies were with, our bio, with the biodiversity crisis. It was the illegal hunter, or the fisher, or the logger, right? the cement company, or, uh, or the oil tanker, etc. These were the, the clear villains of the piece, and we just knew exactly how to deal with them. With the climate crisis, it is humanity itself, with its insatiable greed, that is the problem. Right? And the enemy is us, and our toxins are everywhere. Our villainy is merely living. That exactly is what the climate crisis tells us. So there are no places that are free of the human stain. So it is really us as humans, just by living, you're causing a human stain. And this human stain fills the planet. There are no, pla there are no places free of this. 
There's the National Geographic, which has an ongoing project called the Pristine Seas. And its express aim is to discover those last remaining wild areas in the world. They mount large expeditions to, you know, to far-flung corners of, 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 the, uh, of the ocean, to the Line Islands and elsewhere in the Pacific or in, the, in Antarctic waters, to document what they find and to use this information to convince governments to protect these sacred locations. Right? These waters are teeming with sharks. If you go down there, they're teeming with all the top, top predators that you not, don't find anywhere else. But even here, in the most inhospitable places of the earth or most isolated parts of the world, researchers are finding signs of the human presence. There is no farther afield that we can go. The human stain is everywhere. The wilds are clearly in peril from brutish humanity. The conservation goal then is clear. What we need to do is to erase or at least lighten the human stain on the planet. And as a community of practitioners, we have evolved a pretty large toolbox uh, with which to do this. We fight for protected area networks. So we want more than 30% of the planet okay, uh, within some form of protection by, 20, uh, by, uh, uh, by 2030. That's actually a, you know, an incredible goal. It's 30% by, by 2030. Uh, based on detailed population estimates and models, uh, we establish resource extraction limits on, on wild resources. We deploy in, um, you know, enforcement agencies to curb uh, hunting and trading in wild species. We lovingly restore our degraded ecosystems and reintroduce species that once roamed there. And the list goes on. We've got, this is a, an incredible toolbox that we have for conservation. And it, it goes from the pragmatic to the painstaking to the absolutely preposterous, okay, where you, where you have climate engineering and genetic engineering of species as solutions to the, uh, you know, to the climate crisis and to the biodiversity crisis. My first experience with climate change, first when it, it, came, it came home to me, was I was on a, a remote coral atoll in uh, Lamu Island in Kenya. And we were serving a reef that had not been visited for many, many years. And we, uh, in, for there, in some of the clearest waters that I have dived in, I encountered a bleached reef for the very first time. All around, the coral were completely dying. They were, all these bright coral were turning a strange kind of blue. Okay, we called it Smurf blue. Okay. Uh, and uh, we knew that something was wrong because everywhere it, was looking, it looked the same. We came up from the dive, all of us knew that something large was happening, but I think none of us would know exactly how big it would, would be and how it would change coral reefs around the world. So I came back to India and I had to survey Indian reefs. Mother was there on some of those uh, surveys with me. Uh, the Lakshadweep was the worst hit. And in every reef I visited, the coral was bleached or dying. Now, just to give you a sense, I mean, bleaching is the result of the breakdown of a symbiotic relationship that coral have with a dinoflagellate, with a photosynthetic dinoflagellate. It's an extremely successful uh, relationship uh, which allows the coral to get most of its nutrition from photosynthesis. So even though it's an animal, it gets 90% or 95% of its food from photosynthesis because of this relationship. But it's a very finicky one, and if, you, if temperatures go just slightly higher, that relationship breaks down in a phenomenon called bleaching. The algae leaves, the coral turns white, and if, it, if the stress continues for a long time, the coral essentially dies of hunger. So it's essentially a heat, uh, as a result of heat, the coral dies of hunger, two or three weeks, right? So within a few months, the reefs were a complete mass uh, graveyard of coral. So this was 1998. And in the years that followed, the complex, beautiful architecture of the reef was completely flattened by every monsoon. So where I'd seen these really complex coral reefs everywhere with, their, with all their diverse fish uh, uh, diversity were virtually going everywhere. So uh, I'm sure if you've been reading and following much of this, uh, you know, about what's happening to the world's coral reefs, this is a story that you probably have heard before. It's very familiar to us. Very briefly, over the last two decades, we have been tracking change in these reefs. And this is the overall pattern, with, with plenty of nuance that I won't actually uh, discuss over here. So on the, on the axis, you see what I've drawn, the live coral cover, and that's 1998, where you had that major drop in coral. But uh, what is useful to point out is that in the first decade after 1998, the uh, 
corals of the Lakshadweep showed a significant amount of resilience, actually. They bounced back more than I could ever imagine that they would, right? So the, the same was true of fish communities. Fish communities did not, they were affected for a little bit, but they actually came back really well, much, much better than I ever expected. Uh, and for a while, I actually thought that the reefs of the Lakshadweep would buck the trend of the rest of the world, because in the rest of the world, the reefs were doing really badly. So I thought Lakshadweep was going to be uh, good to do the same as well. I have argued that a large part of the resilience uh, of the reefs was actually due because of, due to the light, uh, fairly light fishing pressure that the Lakshadweep reefs have had. Because most of the fishing was for, the, for, for tuna uh, out in the open ocean. And as a result, the reef had a, a significant amount of resilience and was able to bounce back. So, uh, however, subsequent disturbance events proved me wrong. And as these events became more frequent and more intense, the reef is ratcheting down without enough time to recover from the previous disturbance. This year, 2023, also threatens to be one of the largest El Nino years, and it remains to be seen how the reefs of the Lakshadweep are going to fare in relation to this. So I'm waiting to get into the field right now so that I can see, uh, you know, with all the enthusiasm, as I keep telling people, often undertake a measuring a corpse. Okay, because that's exactly what it feels like. So the patterns, these are, this is a graph which shows you the patterns in live coral complex, cover. They're complex, they vary between islands, and they vary bet between locations as well. So I showed you that one very broad penciled out pattern, but of course it's, it's a little bit more complex than that. And all those lines going up and down are essentially just uh, simple live coral cover, but simple live coral cover is much, much more nuanced because coral are a very diverse community. And so there are lots and lots of coral and all of them behave slightly differently. So one thing that you can possibly do is to actually look at the different kinds of corals that there are. You, could, you have corals that are weedy, you have corals that are, that are stress tolerant, that are competitive coral. So what we did was we tried to look to unpack some of those patterns that were happening under those lines to try to see whether the, the way these corals behave in terms of their life history had anything to do with their long-term fates. As you can see, there are lots of stress-tolerant coral in the Lakshadweep, which means that they should actually be doing uh, much, much better. But when I try to see if they showed similar responses, what you find is that they actually don't. Forget the, you know, this tree in the, you know, over here, but basically what it tells you is that if you look at the, where the various colors of the coral are distributed, they're all over the shop. So what that tells you is that the life history of the coral has very little to do with the fate of the coral. So there's a lot that's happening over here, a, a, a very complex interaction of local geography, coral adaptive capacity, and resistance, which seems to uh, determine these long-term responses. Okay? And there's a lot that we still don't know. So the, it's not as though the fate of the, of the coral reefs are written in stone. Every location is showing something different, and uh, what we know about the biology of coral is certainly not enough to tell us about what, uh, how it's going to fare. So meanwhile, the coral reef community has also evolved. So when the first major pantropical mass bleaching event occurred, there were some that predicted that, this would be the, that the coral reefs would cease to exist in any functional way by 2050. At first, these voices were laughed at as mere doomsayers. Okay, these were, uh, you know, time has shown that in 1998, however, the world lost nearly 8% 8, 8 of all coral reefs in just that one year. And between 2009 and 2018, live coral cover on reefs declined by a further 13.5%. So we are losing these old ecosystems very, very rapidly much, much more rapidly than we can imagine. Within the first decade of 1998, it became increasingly clear that those initial warnings may actually be true, that coral reefs as we know them may cease to exist by 2050. Understanding coral resilience became the need of the hour. I mean, can we actually find pockets of resilience? Can we find ways for reefs to actually resist this? Were there reefs that were uh, actually resisting the temperature stress? Could this be something that coral may just get, get used to? You know, if they're subjected to repeated temperature events, can they actually be, uh, can they get used to it? Uh, and we found that there, 
did seem to be some elements of where, where the coral reef was able to, 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 to resist the, this temperature stress. And when people were beginning to see that thing, conditions were getting more and more desperate, people started using other kinds of means, for instance, restoration. Once coral restoration was considered to be you know, just a, uh, you know, a pie in the sky kind of idea. It's very, very difficult to get coral to, to reproduce. It's very difficult to get them to grow. You can have restoration efforts at very, very small levels, but increasingly, more and more researchers began to think that restoration is perhaps one of the few ways that we can actually get to save the coral reefs of the world. And so from being a very marginal idea, it, became, uh, it began to become a much, much more important idea. Uh, as we came to understand the physiology of bleaching better, it became clear that it was much more complex than we first imagined. And some corals could not just adapt, but also pass on their tolerance in their immediate vicinity. Right? So corals have this, this relationship with zooxanthellae. What we are finding now is that these little dinoflagellates that I talked about, they come in a whole lot of varieties. Some of them are more resistant to temperature, some are less resistant to temperature. And what is possible is for coral to actually switch from one, one of these dinoflagellates to the other, and then you have resistant coral that actually manage to, to survive these temperatures, and then they can potentially even infect corals around them with that kind, with, with these uh, resistant zooxanthellae. So the really interesting things that are emerging about this first dismal picture of, uh, of our reefs dying, to signs that this, that this may not be the full picture. Still others in the University of Hawaii have been going even further lengths. They've been genetically engineering heat-resistant super coral that may someday be translocated to handle uh, climate change. Okay? So they've been taking coral, they've been actually looking at the, at the planulae, they've been genetically modifying them and trying to create coral that will potentially resist this new climate regime. Okay, where temperatures are going to increase, but we'll have coral that can survive them because they're genetically uh, uh, tolerant to them. Still other seemingly harebrained schemes are out there as well, uh, and they're being seriously discussed in some places. For instance, cloud seeding at times when there's a, a lot of temperature stress, or shading large parts of, of reefs with large tarpaulins or things like that to bring the temperatures down. So these look like really crazy ideas, particularly when you see how big reefs are, Okay, but they're actually being considered out there in fora that are not just uh, you know, backroom fora. So the field has moved from despair to a kind of desperate optimism within the span of, uh, of two decades. And the, the, the sum result is this, if brutish humanity has brought coral reefs to the brink, human ingenuity and a bit of engineering will fix the problem. And that seems to be the broad direction that we have been taking. For the reefs of the Lakshadweep, I have my doubts that any of these large engineering solutions will work. If we have to find resilience in these reefs, they will have to come from elsewhere. Most atolls are going to have a hard time uh, surviving the century. We know this, not just for the Lakshadweep, we know this for around the world. The habitability of atolls is dependent completely on that fringe of waves that I was telling you about where the reef is, right? Uh, and that, that fringe there makes the lagoon extremely calm, and if the, the, the area beyond that you can have really stormy conditions. But as long as you have growing reefs, okay, you have conditions underneath that keep, uh, within the lagoon that keep it habitable. Right? And the work we've been doing recently is showing that between sea level rise and repeated El Nino events, this integrity of those reef frameworks, those outer ramparts itself is being compromised right now. So we've been measuring something called reef accretion potential, which is essentially the, the ability of reefs to keep growing. Now you can think of reefs as, as cement factories. They're essentially producing cement, calcium carbonate, in the form, of a, in the form called ara aragonite. And as long as you keep this cement factory open, you're fine, that you know, the, the, the reef continues to, to grow, and the, uh, the atolls behind them, the atoll islands behind them, uh, remain habitable. As long as that cement factory closes, uh, you're going to start having problems. Erosional factors start taking over. So we have been measuring that ability, the ability of that cement factory to remain open. And if you, uh, these are three islands that we measured it on, and that line up there tells you what is approximately the optimal conditions for that cement factory to be, to be producing. Uh, 
when we measured this across these islands, what you see is that for pretty much all the places that we measured them, the ability of the reef to produce calcium carbonate is below the optimum. More worrying uh, for the capital city, which is a Kavrati, which houses the population of something like 13,000 people, the net rates of carbonate production are already negative for many reefs. And so this has, it doesn't bode well at all for the reefs of the Lakshadweep and for the habitability of the islands. So this is what is happening to the outer reef itself. The outer reef itself is crumbling. And over the last few years, at the same time, I told you about the, the tuna fishing that was keeping the reef relatively healthy. What's happening now is that fishermen are beginning to fish the reefs as well. So there's an uncontrolled reef fishing that has begun on the reefs where predatory fish and herbivores are being fished out of the reef in large numbers. And these are extremely important to maintain the resilience of the reef and they are actually being taken out. Most of that, when we looked at, the, at where this fish is, being, is going, we found that most of it, nearly 80% of it was going to the mainland market, very little of it was actually being consumed locally. Okay. So the inherent resilience of the reef that the fish provided uh, that I documented about a decade ago is now being rapidly undercut. Alongside with that, we have the developmental in imaginations of the Indian state. It has big dreams for the Lakshadweep. Okay? As it, it sees it cashing in on high-end tourism. This should be the next Maldives. Right? Um, and so, you know, despite our best efforts, many of these plans are continuing apace. In the next few years, if, uh, you know, if, the, if this has its way, we will see lagoon villas and seaplanes all over the Lakshadweep, designed for tourists to dive on what would essentially be dead reefs. Uh, but that's the plan. So I've been at this now for 25 years or more. And over the last 25 years, I have used almost every synonym of disaster and urgency to describe this challenge of conservation for the reefs of Lakshadweep. Yes, yet if I'm absolutely honest, we have mad managed to make very little difference, which is what I said right at the start. Because if I turn now to that conservation toolbox, you know, I wonder which of this buffet of options would honestly work at the spatial and temporal scales necessary to save the reefs of the Lakshadweep. You know, I, there's a lot of recent attention on protected areas as countries fall over, you know, fall over each other because they have to um, uh, meet global commitments. They are all, everyone's trying to set up marine protected areas, okay? And while marine protected areas are going to be useful, they probably wouldn't save this set of islands, okay? They're certainly not in the, in, uh, when it comes to climate change, it's very difficult to establish marine protected areas against the forces of climate change. And while there are small attempts at ecological restoration taking place even in the Lakshadweep, they are typically so minuscule in scale that they are unlikely to make a difference. Uh, what's left are the, the, the tools at, the, at what I call the preposterous end of the, of the spectrum. And I don't even dare to say their name just in case some enthusiastic entrepreneur thinks that they are, they, it is actually a viable solution. So, each time I step off the boat now to dive on the reefs of Lakshadweep, I no longer have the same you know, sense of wonder that I had when I, when I first went there. What has replaced it is a sense of foreboding and anxiety. Will this be, year be a beaching year? I keep thinking. Will ancient stalwarts like, like these succumb to the next heat wave? This is a coral that is about six or 700 years old and it bleached completely one year in 2016. And I, was, I had my heart in my mouth when I saw this because I thought that I was, we were going to lose this large individual. Thankfully, it survived. But we, I'm not sure if it will survive the next bleaching event. Will some large cyclone have broken the reef to bits? Because cyclones are increasing now in, in their intensity as well. Will overfishing have emptied the reef of whatever fish were left? Okay. Will the reefs be overrun by macroalgae or cyanobacteria, which is becoming increasingly common in these reefs? So each time I go down now into these reefs, I ha what I have is a sense of foreboding and anxiety. Every time I small see a small coral recruit, that's a small coral recruit that could be just about one or two years old. I cannot help but you know, swim up to it and say a small silent prayer you know, and hope that it will grow, grow up and take over the reef along with thousands of its cohorts. 
So I know exactly what I'm looking for when I go up to these little corals. You know, I'm hoping that by some miracle that I do not fully understand, the reefs are going to sort of magically return to, uh, to the way I knew them in 1996 when I first saw them. You know, the reef has surprised me in the past. Potentially it has, the way, has, has ways to surprise me in the future as well. So that's where we stand. And yet, of late, I'm beginning to wonder if I've, if I've got this whole thing wrong, right? I know even as I hope for a return to some kind of prelapsarian dream, some dream of the past, that uh, that reef does not exist. It's a reef of my imagination. It's never going to come back, right? It never will, not in my lifetime, not in many lifetimes. And holding on to that hope keeps me in a state of doom or false optimism, right? Uh, I think there's something profoundly unhelpful about being stuck forever in a mode of crisis. It doesn't help, okay? Maintaining a sense of crisis for a quarter of a century is neither feasible nor does it achieve much. At least for me in the Lakshadweep, it hasn't achieved much at all. So what I'm suggesting is that we actually reframe the conservation problem. As long as we continue to think of the conservation problem as wild nature versus brutish humanity, I think we, it'll continue to play into our, into our savior complexes okay, of conservation biology. You know. If, as Sule insists, that this is a mission-driven discipline, what are we? We are its maverick missionaries fighting uh, you know, on the side of wild nature against brutish humanity, against ourselves to some extent. We are either the fire and brimstone evangelists preaching our eschatological revelations or to the rest of our, our, our benighted brethren, or we are superheroes and saviors. Okay, here with our engineering solutions and our conservation utility belts that will bring the world back from the brink. Okay? Neither direction, either the evangelist nor the superhero, has helped much. Okay? At least not at the scales at which we require them. So while I'm not for once suggesting that there is not a crisis at hand, I think we need to step back from being in crisis mode all the time. If I look at the Lakshadweep from the distance of about a quarter of a century and in the light of everything that is unfolding there, I realize that it is not really the coral reef that is in crisis. The crisis, I think, lies in some kind of, in the special entangled relationship of people that people have had in the Lakshadweep with their land, their fresh water, and the seas around them. It is something that I have taken for granted for the last two decades. But in the last few years, it is becoming increasingly clear that this entangled relationship has served Lakshadweep well since it was first inhabited about 800 years ago. If I documented any resilience in the leaves of the Lakshadweep in the first 10 years when I studied them, it lay as much in the unique relationship that people in the Lakshadweep had with their water, with their land, with their seas, uh, as it was in the reef itself. That relationship, as Suri and I have been discussing over the last several years, uh, is based on an acknowledgement of a certain bounded nature, one that was characterized by a whole bunch of internal feedbacks that limited unbridled exploitation. This integrity of that relationship is now clearly at risk. Between climate change and developmental agendas uh, of the Indian state, the safe space for Lakshadweep is clearly uh, diminishing. What was once a deeply embedded relationship of society and nature is being picked apart and the bounds are being strained. And when those bounds are broken, then we are in territory which is very, very dangerous. This, I think, is the real crisis, this process of disembedding. And if I look around, this is common. I mean, the, this dynamic and embedded relationship that society has had with nature through the ages is unraveling everywhere we look. I mean, fishers, herders, you know, gleaners, hunters, farmers, all these represent humanity's deep entanglement with nature. It is easy, of course, to romanticize these relationships and I, and I, you know, with land and with sea, and I don't su suggest that we do. But in many of the areas we work with, these interactions remain strong, and I think we need to strengthen them. In fact, as conservationists, we have sometimes been complicit in, contrib in contributing to destroying these relationships. So while we've been actively advocating biophilia, we believe that you know, we need to advocate a love for nature uh, as a way to restore human, humanity's uh, relationship with it, we strangely seem to privilege some forms of relationships over others. 
So somehow we believe that the sustainable ecotourist in a, on a Jeep safari or on a Discover scuba dive has a stronger relationship to nature than a medicinal plant collector or a, or a fisherman. We get back to crisis management. By its definition, it is meant to be makeshift. It is a high octane solution to put out occasional fires. It works with incomplete information and it works with haste. It works with the principle of triage. It is in a war zone, you cannot save every leg, you cannot bandage every wound, you have to tackle the urgent, the necessary can wait. By adopting a crisis management as our principal mode of action, however, all we have managed to do in the last 35 years of conservation is to address small problems and to put out tiny fires. I, it wasn't designed, I don't think, uh, to handle systemic issues. As a discipline, it wasn't handled, um, uh, designed like that. And what I am suggesting is that the necessary cannot wait any longer before we continue to tackle the urgent. We need to actually tackle the necessary as well. And what I suggest is that we give up these anti-diluvian dreams of ecosystems as they once were. Our baselines have shifted, sure, our ecosystems are going to become more mediocre, but they have been shifting for a very long time, you know, as far back as the agricultural revolution, if you want, 12,000 years ago. So setting baselines, I think, is useful, but those baselines, I argue, need to be in a shared future, not in any past, in some kind of a pristine past. And what we need to do then is to set, establish a bunch of functional minimums below which you know, serious threshold effects start taking hold in ecosystems, society as well as in politics. So to some extent, this may seem like abandoning of hope and a betrayal of the conservation cause, but I really don't think it is. I mean, our ecosystems are, they're going to become worse than they are, they, they are going to decline in function, but in, that's a reality we just have to live with. I mean, I have to live with that reality every time I go to the Lakshadweep. The, the reefs of the Lakshadweep are certainly not becoming functionally poorer. Uh, but we can sail the seas looking for pristine wildernesses to fence, but that's not going to take us very far. For the rest of the world's ecosystems, outside that little 1% of, of those pristine environments, you know, this, they're outside, those belong to some kind of mythic dream of paradise. And I think we, for the rest of the world, we need to find more practical ways forward. We need to establish just how much uh, our shared social ecological systems can take before they completely collapse. And I think those shared uh, social ecological systems still have resilience in them. They probably just don't look like the way we want them to look but they still have that resilience. And I think that if we can establish what those points of inflection are, we will give ourselves a bit of time. And I think framed like this, it would help us move forward, okay, to identify what those functional thresholds are, both for ecosystems, but also societies. Okay? So the question I ask myself is this, what if we just didn't have three years to solve the conservation problem? What, you know, uh, what if we had 25? or if we had 30, okay, what would we be do, doing different if we said that we have 20, up to 2050 to address some of the systemic problems our, uh, uh, that our look, uh, ecosystems face? So I don't say that I have the sufficient imagination to know exactly what we would do, but that's a conversation that I'd like to start. I mean, for a start, I suspect that we would be, uh, not be investing as much time in desperate engineering solutions, at least as the first port of call. We need to have them there, but they shouldn't be the first thing that we go to. So for a start, if we have the luxury of a generation, can we step back and think more clearly about what makes our social ecological systems tick in the first place? How, can we figure out what makes them work? So we've spent most of our time as conservation scientists thinking about this box, which is ecological dynamics, because we believe, because that's what we've been trained to do. We've been trained to look at, e at ecosystems. We've been trained to look at how species behave. So let's look at ecological dynamics. If we know how this works, okay, then that's what we know how to, we know how to fix it. Okay? But ecosystems rarely exist in vacuums. They are always sites of derived function, complex societal relationships, human aspirations, and individual identities. Now, David Harvey, one of the, most, uh, the foremost contemporary interpreters of Marx, 
rights of the seven moments of levers that keep global economies in, uh, in place. But many of the levers he speaks of can be modified to look at social ecological systems as well. So we know, for instance, that institutions, technology, and the way people engage with natural resources are critical to how shared social ecological uh, systems are shaped. But there are a host of other factors that influence how humans dialectically modify ecological dynamics. These include you know, our attitudes to nature, daily life, social relationships, our mental conceptions, how we make sense of the world. All of these together, I think, interact in really complex ways within many of our systems. <coughs> and I think that we need to understand that okay, before we know exactly how our systems need to be modified or if they need to be modified at all. I don't think this is the, single, the field of a single intellectual field. I think it requires uh, thinkers from a variety of epistemic backgrounds to contribute to our understanding of social ecological systems. Most importantly, I think this entire social ecological system is set firmly in the history and geography of place. What this suggests is that every geography has its very own unique social ecology. One that is strongly influenced by the particular and the contingent history of that particular place. <coughs> so that's a, a bit of a bold statement because if you look at, if based on that, if you look at the conservation uh, toolbox that we talked about, uh, uh, talked before, you know, if what I suggest is true, it will mean that we need to look at this conservation toolbox quite carefully. Most of these ideas, okay, and approaches are, are Platonic in ideal, by which, by which I mean that they are, they come from a, a sense of being, you know, universal, you know, non-contingent, that they work pretty much everywhere. Okay? and that they are true here, as true here as they will be in Europe as they will be everywhere else. Okay? So I, I understand completely the philosophy that underpins many of these approaches. The scale of the problem is global, and so our responses need to be equally ambitious, they need to be equally coherent, and they need to be equally global in their scope and their direction. However, if what predominantly governs our systems is completely locally contingent, and if it varies with geography, if it varies with history and with culture, it frustrates this universalizing project. If theoretically the search of the globally consistent is futile, our rummaging for global solutions may also be. Okay, if not futile, at least not very effective. So if I speak today to people in Lakshadweep, the catastrophic picture I painted of the reefs and islands is not front and center in their lives mm -hmm. at all. <coughs> the people of Lakshadweep are among the most educated people in the country. So, of course, many have heard of climate change. But for them, they are more likely to link climate change with images of polar bears on melting ice caps than to the crumbling reefs around them. Right? At the scale of human life, climate change is hardly the most important issue. At first, this blind spot surprised me. How could it possibly be that a society so, how could it be that a society that is so surrounded by the self-evident crisis be so oblivious to it? But start listening to the community about what actually affects their lives. And a completely different picture kind of starts emerging. They will talk to you about fresh water. They'll talk to you about the, 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 the fears for, this, for, uh, for how these stores will, will survive into the future, about fresh water itself. They'll talk to you about health, okay, particularly the health of the old and the health of women. They'll talk to you about their autonomy and their ability to take control of their lives. Okay? So very rarely will climate change ever be part of the discussion, but it is the hyper object that is invisibly present in all of these discussions. Right? The, their concerns are not drawn from any universal understanding of how ecosystems function, but they are existential and they are real. Okay? And they are very very local. What is true of the Lakshadweep is probably not true of any other place. Okay? And in this space, I think, is where solutions suggest themselves. And they offer much, much more creative possibilities than our crisis toolbox can ever uh, allow. So the ancient Romans believed in, you know, in two types of gods. You had these mighty universal gods you know, that governed all the big things. You have Jupiter and Apollo and all these other big gods. 
right? But at the level of every local region, in towns and in villages, those titan gods had very little influence. Okay, here at more human scales, there were other forces that were overridingly important. These were the, uh, the genie loci, these were, or the genius of the place. Okay? And that's not something unique to the Romans. The Greeks had their daemons, and, ev and every village and forest in India has its own spirit force. Right? The genius of the place represents for me the inherent wisdom and knowledge that every geography carries with it. Every genius speaks with a local dialect, a kind of vernacular that is completely off that location. I think engaging with the genius of that place requires us to understand and to speak in its particular vernacular. So what I'm supposing is that we look beyond our universal toolbox and reframe conservation as a more vernacular discipline, one that is rooted in local ecology, local society, and local practice. So I'm borrowing the idea of the vernacular. The idea of the vernacular is not new. Okay? It has existed from at least 1960s in architecture. Uh, where it talks about a form of locally appropriate building that uses traditional materials and, uh, uh, and ideas. More critically, the vernacular is uninfluenced by formal intellectual trends and architectural thought. It's completely off the place, not drawn from any larger intellectual tradition. And I think that if we modify the, the principal philosophy of vernacular architecture, it suits very well what I want to propose here. Vernacular conservation is a conservation of the people and by the people, but not for the people. Okay. I'll admit that I have thought about this like this, but I, I've never not done it myself. Okay. I have been too dazzled by the universal uh, narratives of crisis, and all the work of our group has been about documenting this crisis. We are only making our first baby steps about what a more vernacular approach would look like and after more than 25 years, we have only now begun to listen. Okay. So then, here are my two big takeaways. First, we need to modify our expectations and give up on dreams of Eden. We need to give ourselves time, plenty of time. My suggestion is 30 years, around 10 times more than most project cycles. Why 30 years? Well, because 30 years is a single human generation. It probably is the time, for it, 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 it probably is the time that, it, that societies take to change. It's for the old patriarchs to die, right? And for a new breed of thinkers uh, and managers to take over. If we need our moribund institution, toxic marketplaces to change, it will need time. It takes a generation to change attitudes. 30 years also matches much better the scales at which most of our ecosystems uh, work. Okay, they work at, at those longer time scales. Uh, second, we need to be wary of universal essentialist solutions to the conservation crisis. Embracing the vernacular requires conservation, and, and, uh, conservation science and practice to be locally embedded and long-term. It needs to arise from the concerns and preoccupations that arise from these local geographies. This will mean, I think, rethinking how we frame our questions, for how we conduct ourselves with local communities, for how we raise money and deploy it, I think it'll also mean rethinking what success looks like in many of our ecosystems. Uh, as we move forward, it may be useful to ask ourselves if we have the required skills and the imagination to be instruments of long-term change. And I'll leave that as an open question. So, thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot for the insightful presentation. Uh, it was actually um, having a lot of the tools that uh, I was also like looking for regarding the coral reefs illustration. Uh, mainly about the toolbox that you just introduced, I'm mostly focused on um, the locals and how they're adapting to climate change. And among two of the tools you were also saying, or it was written that uh, we're, you're suggesting alternative livelihoods and incentives for the local communities. So I'm wondering how are we asking like the local people who are mostly like the most people affected by the climate change, and if we're talk talking about climate justice, like what kind of incentives are you suggesting that 
we would be asking the locals to, uh, like, what are we asking them for the contribution in such a problem they are not engaged with, uh, especially if we are asking them to cut down maybe their overfishing around the coral leaves or using them in a better way, and this will definitely affect their uh, economic income. So, like, how are you seeing that this can be happening through the locals? Because I'm, I'm like, yeah, I forgot to introduce myself, so uh, I'm co-founder of Banlastic Egypt, and it's um, a con environmental conservation in Alexandria in Egypt, and I'm mostly like interested in how can we work with the fishermen, and how can we help them adapt to the effect of the climate change? Thank you. So, I mean, that's a, that's a really complex question, and I think it's a very relevant one as well. My, I actually don't really have many answers that would satisfy myself. But what I'll say is this, that when we come in from the outside, when we parachute into local communities with platters of things that we offer you know, as solutions, uh, I think communities very quickly see through, uh, you know, they know exactly how to navigate those things because they've been working with people coming in and going out all the time. And I feel that we need to move away from those ways of looking at engaging with local communities as well. I think we need to have a lot more humility in our engagements and recognize that uh, we don't need to come in with solutions. We need to come into communities saying, here we have a set of skills. Can we start a conversation? Can we help? And I think that is a, probably a better place to start. Uh, being able to first earn a community's trust in what we're what we trying to do. Uh, we will then, I think, if you have that conversation honestly, then uh, local communities themselves can, will potentially have a wealth of ideas about how to deal with many of these changes. Because communities have experienced change in many, respect, in, in many ways. And I think that the only thing that we can do then is to become, to catalyze some of these changes uh, and to build some of the resilience that already exists within these communities. And I think that that's the only thing that I can suggest we do. I don't think that there are, that, uh, I think I would like to move away from suggesting that there are certain prescriptive responses that we can, that we come in with. That's what I want to move away from. Good evening. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, my name is Hasita. I am a communications professional and a fellow scuba diver. Um, thank you so much. Learned so much from this conversation. And I have two questions, in fact. My first question for you, Rohan, is this. You've spoken about maybe reframing some of the expectations we have in the context of conservation. Uh, as a thought experiment, if we had to reimagine what a reef could potentially be in the next 10 years, what, what do you think that would look like? Um, I mean, I know the trajectory that reefs are taking, okay? Um, and what I do see is that reefs, they, the amount of resilience that we're seeing in reefs varies considerably from place to place. So you can have a best of all possible worlds and the worst of all possible worlds. The worst, worst of all possible worlds I have seen. They're flat dead scapes with absolutely nothing on them. They're devoid of all the, all the fish, they're devoid of a whole lot of invertebrates, um, and they are completely taken over by macroalgae, okay? And they can be really, really, uh, th that's the worst possible scenario. What I suspect is going to happen is actually a little bit different from that. What we're going to see is increasingly patchy reefs, reefs that are, you have some areas that are really good, some areas that are not so, not so good. And the, that heterogeneity in responses is likely what we're going to see uh, over the next 10 to 15 or 20 years. The question that we need to ask ourselves is that at the local level, is there something that uh, is possible to do to make sure that in that patchiness, we can uh, find ways to ensure that the resilience of some of the best patches are maintained. And that, I think, at the local level, it is possible to do things. So uh, we know, for instance, that uh, if you have 
uh, high amounts of nutrients going in because of, of pollution, that algal growth might, might increase. So for instance, those are small point things that you can actually do at the local level. Having said that, we know that unless the global climate uh, doesn't take another t take a turn, it's probably going to be uh, you know quite dismal, right? But I still hold out on hope, knowing that uh, it's not going to be a uniform response, and the fact that there is variability gives me some sense of hope that they, that you know it won't be as bad as all of that. Got it. Thank you. My second uh, question is if, actually, if you don't mind, we'll Sean, come back. If we yeah. have time, we'll come back Sean, for the second no question. Hi, um, thanks for a uh, really interesting talk. My name is uh, Rudra, and four of us are actually master students of conservation. So, sorry for embarrassing you guys. I, I can't uh, see you. My, I can stand up, sure. Uh, so, my question is that since the 70s, we've kind of seen this movement towards conservation and nature preservation, uh, which we've largely kind of borrowed from the West, from the Sierra Club uh, paradigm. Um, and given that there are so many trade-offs that you explained in your work um, with conservation and local community participation. Do you think that reflexivity in conservation could help in making the trade-offs more implicit? Or rather, would the politics of development change if conservationists themselves were extremely reflex, uh, you know, reflective? That's a large philosophical question, I suppose. I mean, reflexivity is generally good in pretty much everything we do, right? Uh, we have, uh, how much we as conservationists are complicit in much of the directions we're taking is, is a, I think is an important question to ask. Uh, through the last few decades, what you do see in conservation, and this is really a criticism of, of conservation as a movement, we keep looking for solutions uh, that try to fix the immediate problem without actually facing up front what the most significant problems are, which is market-based capitalism, for instance, or global consumption. We will uh, be happy to get into bed with the very, you know, with exactly the same partners that actually got us here in the same place, in the, in the first place. And I think that it is important for us to be reflexive about that, about how we, you know, about how we do our conservation whether it is possible to, I mean, in the papers that I'm publishing right now, um, I find it very difficult to actually end with a positive message. And I basically say that the reefs of the Lakshadweep will not survive unless we call out you know, global capitalism for what it is and global consumption models for what they are. And uh, we need more and more as, conservation, as conservationists to call the, the climate crisis for what it is. right? And it isn't actually to do with, with fossil fuels. That's certainly one part of the problem. It has a lot more to do with global consumption. And if we, as conservationists, are able to do that, I think we'll be being a bit more honest to the scale of the problem. Hi, I'm Benedict. I run this magazine called Sustainability Next. Uh, interesting uh, solution. Uh, I think today the debate is uh, about local problems, global solutions, global solutions, local problems. So we've been debating these uh, uh, frames. Uh, so my large question is today everything is getting universalized. We are losing local uh, talent, we are losing local medicines, local culture. <clears throat> so it, everything is getting universalized. So I'm kind of wondering that you're being very optimistic, saying that uh, local solutions for conservation. I mean, I, <clears throat> I don't claim that I, I think it's going to work. I'm not sure if it will work at all. But I think my radical proposal is this, that there are only local problems and there are only local solutions. Uh, and that's clearly a mischaracterization of the scale of the problem. Okay. Global climate change from the work that I've done show is, is very real, it's there. Reefs are declining. But what I mean to say is that actually when it comes to what it means on the ground, those global problems make no difference at all. The only reason that documenting those 25 years of my data to document the decline of those coral reefs, the only thing that it has helped me to do is to publish papers which 
reaffirm what we already knew. That there is this global fingerprint and the Lakshadweep is one additional data point to show that. That's the only thing it has actually helped me do. At the local level, uh, the fact that the reefs are declining is not something that the local communities think of as being the most important thing. But when I, but the, the, the epiphenomenal effects of all of that, inclu including when it comes to freshwater, when it comes to the decline of their, of their uh, when it comes to coastal erosion, when it comes to all the factors that affect the, the local well-being, those are factors that actually are something that, I can, that they can get a handle on. And they actually know that they can do something about them. And so I really don't, I, for me, those, the larger conversations about the conservation crisis at the local level are a bit of a distraction, right? Uh, they don't help us to, first of all, listen to what local problems are. Okay, and every local problem suggests its own set of solutions, and I think what that allows us to do is to be much, much more creative, to have a much, much wider set of, of options to work with. Uh, and you know, having said that, I realize that this is again a universalizing claim. Okay, so you should take that as well with a pinch of salt. Okay. Yes, hi. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Gayatri. I'm a student at uh, Simrimji University, first year, Environmental Science and Sustainability. Um, so I enjoyed the talk immensely, and my question would be regarding, towards the end of the talk, um, you made, uh, you know, we are thinking of local solutions and uh, global problems and all of that. Would local in that context equate to indigenous in any way? Or can we think of indigenous solutions what would the word indigenous here mean? That's an important question, and I'm not sure I actually have the skills to be able to answer that. Probably, Harani, do you have a sense of how you would define indigenous? In I mean, I, maybe you should just tell her what, how, how long Lakshadweep has been inhabited. So yeah, so Lakshadweep has been inha inhabited for about the last 800 years. So I'm not sure what indigenous means in that context, okay? Uh, but I, I think it's one of those contexts that need a little bit of unpacking, and where the indigenous, uh, which is why I try to use the word local more than anything else, essentially to sidestep that problem. Yeah. They wouldn't be like the Sholigas, for instance. So, but they've been there for 800 years. What's interesting about these, the peopling of these islands is like the peopling of the Caribbean. And in fact, much later than the peopling of the Caribbean. It's people who have settled cultures who come to this place, bringing in already practices, a certain social structure to this place. So these are all very vague kind of differentiators, but you often associate indigeneity with a much more embedded sort of evolution of cultures, but this is very, very, uh, that's why I think Ron and I have been using the word local more than indigenous. <laughs> In this context. And the exchanges between that and the mainland, which is largely Kerala, is still very frequent. Yeah. So there is also that constant modifier influence, which you would also not yeah. have. Enough. I mean, it's had an umbilical cord to the yeah. Malabar coast. And so. But the other thing to say is that <coughs> ecological knowledge and knowledge about and is, is, is something that does develop in communities fairly rapidly. You spend enough time you spend a couple of generations engaging with, with the environment and certain ways of knowing do develop. So the idea of traditional ecological knowledge that is something that is embedded in some deep past is not something that I totally ascribe to. I think that it's, it's dynamic, it's constantly changing, it's constantly evolving and adapting. So I'll just repeat that for the recording. The question was, how can you strengthen the local going forward? Um, I'm not sure I know, but I think it should start with, with conversations and with listening. Uh, I really think that we need to be doing much, much more listening and much less going in with prescriptive solutions. Uh, 
I think that the dimensions of uh, the dimensions of the local will suggest themselves often by local communities themselves. Rohan, would you want to tell them about the the recent documentary and the WhatsApp posters? And I'm just thinking because that's. So one thing that we've been trying to do right now is to to document various ways uh, local com the communities in the Lakshadweep use their their local systems. What we're trying to do, the, the people in the Lakshadweep take a huge amount of pride. In, the, in their engagement with, with, with nature, whether it is with fishing, whether it is with uh, you know, their local recipes, etc. And so we are, uh, one of the projects that we're working on is to document ways of life. And we're trying to say, you know, these local ways of life represent to some extent a form of embedding in, the nat in, in local systems. So that's part of the projects that we're working on right now. It's a work in progress. And over the next few years, we're hoping to, to build that much, much more. So there's a wonderful documentary which, which is now up on YouTube? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> which uh, they have done, which is again through the eyes of someone from Lakshadweep in the boat no. looking at fishing. What does that mean to spend a day out in the ocean? What are the changes they have seen and that something. So that actually leads me to one question that I did want to ask and if there's, there seems to be some time for it. And I'm asking because people might not know this about Rohan, but he's, uh, well, quite apart from the climate science, he's also someone who reads and writes. And you can see some of the, the you know, from the fonts he's chosen to the illustrations he's done to some, to someone who believes that the humanities also has a huge role to play. And again, as a university which is trying to link some of these science, not just the science and the social science and the politics which, uh, you know, you raised, for example, but also the humanities. What do you feel that has... Uh, as a, as an, not just enriching our own perceptions, but in terms of action or communication or uh, engaging people more widely. Because I think the problems with the science that, that at least I feel after doing this for 30 years is, we land up always speaking to the choir. I mean, all of you have come in here to this room because you're already interested in these problems and you already think this is important. But then there's this huge uh, crowd of people outside this room, much larger than the one that is in, and it's not that they don't care about nature. Everybody, I think, cares about nature. But it's somehow that they don't think it's hmm. critical enough, urgent enough. I don't know what, what else. How, how, how do we bring them into this room? Well, first of all, I think that we, I mean, science, you know, arrogates to itself a huge amount of responsibility. And it has been given, to some extent, given that uh, you know the same kind of agency that the that the you know that the church had in some time of time in the past, and uh, we need to wear that with a certain you know with much much more responsibility than we do. Okay, oh, we have too much of we don't have enough of humility, I think, when we are, when as scientists because we think that we are after the truth with a capital T. The humanities, uh, I think, most of the humanities don't really have that. And I think that that's actually something to learn, a little bit of that humility, where they're saying that we are trying to understand all of the human experience um, and recognize that that is highly subjective and it is highly, you know, there's a creative and subjective element to it, which uh, is still approaching the truth, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the truth with the capital T. It's multiple truths with many small t's. And I think that that's a, uh, it's a very, you know, for me it's a very enriching uh, way to move forward because when, I think that part of the reason that we, that we speak to the choir and speak within these, you know, echo chambers is because to some extent I think we are uncomfortable with dealing with the messiness of uh, the rest of the world. We like to speak with our little equations and our graphs and our squiggly lines going up and down. But all of these are, uh, you know, signifiers of some, some kind of specialized knowledge that we have. And then we want to be able to interpret that for the rest of the world. I think that, that artists, poets, uh, you know, musicians have a lot more to contribute uh, than, uh, than we normally believe. And I think that because people's responses are often affective more than, uh, more than rational, I think we need uh, all of that to come to bear when we are talking about, uh, you know, the state of nature and making a change for, say, for the state of nature. Thanks. Yes, Madhu. Yes. 
if um, my name is Madhu, I am also an ecologist, a lapsed one. Uh, <laughs> my question is if the sensibilities were to change, as you've been suggesting, from a more universal narrative of crisis to a more embedded vernacular version of possibilities, how would the politics need to change to enable that? Madhu has as always asked you the toughest question <laughs> after claiming he's a lapsed ecologist. <laughs> exactly. well, that is not an ecologist question at all. Yeah. <laughs> yes. To be fair about it. Uh, <clears throat> Look, actually, I mean, I have to think about that, Madhu. And we can probably think about that later as well over a, a drink or two. But uh, my, my feeling is that politics responds fairly quickly to the local. Uh, because uh, politics deals much, much more, I think, with the, with the lives of individual people. And even though we might be extremely cynical about the, you know, the state of uh, national or global politics, uh, Politics, I think, is I think we do politics a disservice. I think we that um, it's the one way that people feel that they have a certain amount of agency and a certain amount of voice. Uh, so my feeling is politics is not going to be the problem. All we just need to to, to do, I think, is to keep politics alive. We have to recognize that first of all, as scientists, we are also politicians that we are engaging in, in politics, whether we like it or not, no matter how objective we believe we are. That's the first thing. The second is that we need to be able to allow a certain amount of political determination to be handed to communities. And where we see that force going away, that's where we as a society need to, to work. Politics itself, I think, you know, people know how to how to work with that at the local level. And it, and it can be very, very, responses, uh, very, very res uh, responsive to changes taking place at the local, at, at, on the ground. I'm not sure if that's a satisfactory answer. Shashwat, do you have a question? Yeah, I just had one question. You started the whole uh, talk today and you spoke about the idea of erasing the human stain. And in this world that we are talking about, you know, dramatic changes, be it extinction rebellion or things like that, where we are talking about how we need to, you know, actively work towards reducing our own footprints, our own, you know, impact that we are having globally on all the environment systems. Uh, at somewhere you, you shifted gears and you spoke about, you know, the necessary and the urgent. I wanted your take and why, why we, you emphasize on the necessary part, what happens to the urgent? Should we actively work towards, you know, those kind of movements, the human stain, is it still a valid, you know? I mean, I was using the, the, the idea of the human stain ironically. And <laughs> I honestly think that the, as long as we think of all human existence as, you know, as staining the planet, I don't think we're gonna make much, uh, you know, I think it's, we need to celebrate the human color. That, uh, you know, I think that's, that's, it's very, very critical. Uh, I think that we will always need crisis science. We will need to have ways to deal with fires when they come. I'm not suggesting that we throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think that there's been a lot of progress in terms of trying to understand how to address, to fix specific problems. But I'm, what I'm saying is that that cannot be our only mode of engagement. We need both. Okay. And we need much, much more thinking about the more systemic issues. So I think, uh, I mean, we, we're implicitly on the same page, but I think just from a cautionary perspective, I think we fall prey to the same universalizing tendency. When we cast this as a human stain, as if the ca human with a capital H, right, which encompasses all living seven and a half billion human beings on the planet, and we very, very clearly know that footprints vary enormously. And there's more social relationships and structures that operate than some universal notion of the human. I think we should be very mindful of that as ecologists in the first instance, because I think the first separation we do is between nature and the human. 
as if this entire human is one homogenous monolithic entity, equally guilty of the stain or not guilty of the stain or, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think I, I, it's just a comment. No, it's a absolutely. question. <laughs> There is, you had a second question and I stopped you because of time, but no problem at all, thank you. Uh, so for those of us who don't come from marine science or science in, in that sense, um, the analogy that always comes to me is one of an experienced intern like Robert De Niro in the movie, right? We have something to contribute, but maybe not necessarily in the domain or the realm of science. Uh, how do we get involved? Because I think intentionality is definitely there. Uh, it's just that sometimes we don't know where to begin. So that was my question for both of you, actually. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I think, first of all, the, I mean, this is a difficult one. And, and I, I should have a response to this, because it's an, <laughs> it's an important question. Okay. Uh, I'll have to think a little bit. Haruni, why don't you respond? I'll think a little bit more. <laughs> I'll give you the, the side, the, the answer I often give from a tree's perspective. You'll have to translate it to your scuba diving marine perspective. But the thing is really find your comfort zone because there are, let's say you were interested in trees and conservation of forests. There are multiple things you could do. You could do, if education is your comfort zone, you know, take children around for walks, teach them how to learn what species grow around them. If it's uh, then otherwise you might want to get into composting. I think where we often get, uh, st where it often is a challenge uh, is the solutions that are uh, commonly peddled, you know, which are individual. Take your, don't take a plastic bag shopping. Yes, that's of course very important, but it can't stop there. Or compost your own. But if you do anything as a group, so take children around, do composting in your yard, that might be one thing. If you're comfortable with the more political aspect of it, then canvas your MP or MLA, get to know them, see what you could do, or you know, write a letter to lobby someone. If it's media, then you could write articles. If it's activism, and you're absolutely fine with that, then be an activist, get out of the streets. But everyone will have a comfort level. So that's why it's very important to see what is in your comfort level, and sometimes that's a journey. But there's always some, some place that you could start, and uh, there's always going to be a school or a college or an educational institution of some kind which might be the easiest place to reach out to because then there are students who can get involved in some, is something like this. And I think when you get younger people, this is something we've seen clearly at the university, which is, uh, I don't know if you were there when I started the introduction, but this, you know, our climate festival we do every year, this year is getting 15,000 people for uh, children for Forest of Life. And we see that that has such a spillover effect because once younger people come in and then they spread this to other people, it sort of really has a multiplier effect. So that would be my, my one thing. I mean, that's very comprehensive. The only other thing that I would say, but potentially, is that uh, each of us as individuals, I think, need to constantly try to make the effort to, l to live our lives more deliberately. Uh, and because everything is so easy and convenient right now, that living a deliberate life is a, is is actually among the most difficult things that we that we can do. But I think living deliberate lives is is probably the one the the place that all of us need to try to move towards. Uh, and I say that as well in terms of the convenience of going to these locations. We, we you know we are we are uh, completely entrapped by even the you know the screensaver that I showed you of the coral reefs and things like that. Uh, and we would love to be able to go to these locations and see them for what they are, etc. But then, uh, I, and I, th I think that it is important for us to go and experience these landscapes as well. But when we do that, uh, let us become advocates and allies for these locations and for these people. And I think that's part of the of the job that that the rest of us can be as well. We really need to become advocates and allies. Because often, when it comes to the politics, uh, many of these communities don't have the same political voice as the rest of us. And so that is an important job that we can play. Thank you. We have time for one last question, if anyone has. Question, yes, this. Um, so I just had a quick question. So in my school, we have this mission kind of thing 
where um, s- some children from the school work together to try and make our whole earth a greener and a safer ecosystem. So do you have any tips on how it um, can help, any things that can help them? Oh, sorry, what's your name? Naivanya. Naivanya, yeah. So, look, when I was actually talking about the, uh, you know, the kinds of approaches that we need, I was reaching out to people like you. Because most of us are not going to make a difference at all. Okay, most of us have finished our, you know, our careers. We are towards the end of our careers, and etc. And I think that if that sensitivity comes, you are going to be the people of 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 tomorrow. That I'm actually thinking that uh, most of my hope is in people like you, who are going to be able to make a difference for tomorrow. And so, the, developing that sensitivity and keeping your eyes open to that, I think, is the most important thing. And I think you're making a good start. With that, a huge thank you once again to Rohan. Thank you. And uh, just as a shout out also to those watching this recording because later people will watch it online too. Uh, Rohan and I are going to do a much more freewheeling talk at Azim Premji University tomorrow in a green room which Shashwat will record. It will be up on the university's YouTube channel which is a conversation much more I mean, we have these often after these talks, which goes into things like what gives you hope, where do you see the future of the world going, and such like existential questions. Yes, Rohan, <laughs> which we will get into tomorrow. So please do look for that and look for the other conversations again we've had. If you go to the university, Azim Primji University YouTube channel and click on the, I mean, look for the search for the hashtag Let's Talk Climate Change, you'll see this and a lot of other conversations. Yeah? So thank you very much all for coming.